Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The text for our message today is from Mark's Gospel, the eighth chapter. Here are these key verses. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. This is our text. When Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of Christ, came out several years ago now, it created quite a stir. Um, critics uh, thought it was uh, too violent, uh, too, uh, too brutal, too gory. Um, all of the scourging and the crucifixion of, that Christ had to suffer was, uh, was just considered too long and too gory. It was considered inappropriate for children and for many adults. To many, it was just so very offensive. It was just too much. The Passion of Christ was like sticker shock to those who saw it. They were shocked at the brutality and the violence. Um, it just, many just failed to understand why did Jesus have to endure all of this cruelty. The world uh, was generally shocked to even suggest that such a thing was necessary to save people from their sins. Well, this reaction is similar to another kind of sticker shock you maybe are more familiar with. Uh, you go to buy an appliance or a car or something and you get to the dealer and, and you say, that can't possibly be the price. I'm not going to pay that. There must be some kind of mistake here. I've got to negotiate a better deal. You see, the point is, we have our ideas of what we think things should be worth. And in a similar manner, we can have our own ideas of what we think it should cost to save us. What we think it should cost to be a disciple. Well, the disciples had their ideas too. Peter had his idea of what the Christ should be like. Um, but our Lord had different ideas. In our Gospel today from Mark chapter 8, uh, we find it's not only the middle of Mark's gospel in terms of chapters and verses, but this text is, a, is a, at a key point where Jesus turns decisively and starts heading towards Jerusalem and the cross. He knows where he's going, and he knows what he's going to do, but the disciples do not. And so the disciples, like many today, they're just they're torn in two directions. They've come to a sort of fork in the road. You see, they want to follow Jesus, but they also want to follow their own desires. They want to follow the words of Yogi Berra. Now, Yogi Berra, for those of you who don't remember or are too young, Yogi Berra was a famous uh, catcher for the New York Yankees and coached for many years. But most importantly, Yogi was known for his words of wisdom that normally made no sense at all. So, for example, Yogi said one day, he said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, like y Yogi here, the disciples have come to a fork in the road. And they see two different directions that Jesus could go. Um, they, they, at one point, they, they want to follow Jesus. They want to stick with him and follow him. Well, at the same time, insisting Jesus follow the path that they want to go. As our lesson begins today, we find Peter confessing that Jesus is the Christ. He and the disciples, they think they got it figured out. He's the Christ. God's anointed. But just as this happens, God's plan of salvation leaves them with sticker shock. Jesus says, the Son of Man must suffer many things. God's going to send his Son to this world to suffer? That's not what they expected. What the disciples fail to understand 
is that Jesus must suffer many things because they were powerless to save themselves. The Apostle Paul said it well in our epistle today that Vicar wrote, uh, read here earlier from Romans. He said, at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus' suffering and death was necessary. Jesus said he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. Well, if this first thing that Jesus told the disciples, if that staggered him, what he said next must have just absolutely floored them. Not only must he suffer many things, but he must be killed. Why must the Son of God be killed? Again, Romans helps us out here. When Paul said, the wages of sin is death. You see, it's, it's, it's no easy thing. There's, it's not, no shortcut to, to salvation. I think by this time, the disciples are so confused, they're so stunned, that I, I suspect they didn't even hear the third thing Jesus said here. He said that he, after three days, he's going to rise again. But I suspect that this time, all they could think of was, their master's going to leave them. Well, it's in this state of sticker shock that we hear Peter say, Never, Lord. This has never happened to you. Peter didn't want to believe what Jesus had told them. That's not what he expected the Christ to be like. And so Peter takes Jesus aside, not because he doesn't understand what Jesus just said, but because he doesn't want to believe it. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand what he said, but he didn't believe what he, he didn't want. That, he didn't like it, I guess you could say. Reminds me of something uh, Mark Twain once said concerning Scripture. He was quoted once as saying, you know, many people are bothered by those passages of Scripture they do not understand. But as for me, I've always noticed those passages of Scripture that trouble me the most are the ones I do understand. In other words, knowing what God expects from us can be a lot harder to deal with than not understanding at all. Peter, like the disciples, and like many in our world today, don't understand the price that was needed for our salvation, that it was necessary. His motives seem to be very noble. Um, you know, he wants to defend Jesus. But in reality, it reveals his innermost thoughts that, that sin really isn't that bad at all. I'm, I'm not that bad. The sticker shock of Peter is still common in our world today. Self-righteousness is the world's way of saying, you know, if I just work hard enough, if I just do the best I can, I'm going to be okay. That's one of the reasons why so many people, I think, were shocked at all the suffering and death that Jesus had to go through on the cross in the, in, in the movie, the, the Passion of Christ. See, the world believes that, you know, we're really doing okay all by ourselves. Unfortunately, we too can fall into the same trap of thinking that you know, sin really isn't that bad. We can weakly go through the motions of confessing that we are poor, miserable sinners. We can um, do that, but yet still not understand what it took to wash away those sins. There are many today who, who will say, I, and I've heard it many times in my ministry, say, well, you know, my name's on the church roster. That should be good enough. I put my offering in the offering plate. Well, I went to church today. I even helped out with projects at church. All these things should make God happy with me for what I've done. Jesus' words to Peter, I think, can very well be spoken to us. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Peter was an instant of Satan because... He's trying to tempt Jesus to follow man's ways. Even though God's word tells us that my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. Or maybe Mark Twain does have it right and that maybe we do understand more than we want to admit. 
Maybe we do realize just how great our own sin is and how far from God that we have drifted. And yet, our Lord Jesus Christ still wants us to come to him. No strings attached. The shocking death of the Son of God on the cross was necessary. Because of that, our debt has now been paid in full. There's a story of uh, two boys who grew up as best friends. After high school, they, they both went off to college. One went to, to law school, eventually became a lawyer, and uh, eventually a, a judge in the courtroom. The other boy went off to college too, but he spent uh, his, most of his college life uh, enjoying college life. Um, eventually, though, he had to drop out. He uh, was in and out of jobs and in and out of trouble with the law over the years. Over the years, they'd, the two boys had kind of lost track of each other, hadn't been in contact for much, until one day they met again in a courtroom. One was the judge, and one was the accused, the defendant. Now, this particular case was one where the judge would hear the case. There was no jury. The judge would rule on, on the case. And uh, if the accused was found guilty, the, uh, the maximum penalty the law would allow for this offense was a, a fine of $2,000. And so the judge heard the case, and uh, he found uh, the defendant, his old buddy, guilty. And then according to the law, he pronounced the maximum penalty allowed, $2,000. Afterwards, he got up from the bench, took his black robe off, went down to the clerk of court and wrote a personal check for $2,000. I like that story because it's not unlike what God has done for us. God has pronounced us guilty. We're sinners. And he's pronounced the maximum penalty, death. But then he took that penalty upon himself in the suffering death of his son, Jesus Christ. We are free now because of, of, of him, of Christ. We're free at his expense. Talk about your, your sticker shot. And yet, even though all of our debt is paid in full, we're reconciled to God, Jesus goes on today in a lesson to say, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now these words of, uh, of, of Jesus here are not some kind of prescription or some payment for our salvation, how we can earn our salvation. That's not what's meant at all. Um, our debt has already been paid in full. The slate's wiped clean. You see, the cost of being a disciple is not about a payment. It's about trust. It's about a response to Jesus. What we do in faith is our response to what God has done for us. Denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him is, I think, understood uh, best, too, under the words of Paul again. This time from 2 Corinthians, where Paul writes, And he died for all, that all who sh live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. Again, in Galatians, he wrote, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their old sinful nature with its passions and its desires. So what's this all mean for you and me today? It means that we don't let anything get between us and our Lord. We trust him. Our Lord's passion is to be our passion to serve and follow him. God gives us the passion so that we can deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. We, we call this passion or faith. No longer do we live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes this happen. As we make use of the tools that God's given us. We proclaim it as we remember our baptism. We are... We are we feast on it 
at his table in Holy Communion. And we are nourished by the Holy Spirit as we hear God's word in Scripture. You know, the passion of Christ, even though it's been many years, created quite a stir. And it upset many people. But you know the one thing that I really appreciated about it, that I thought it, it really did a good job of, was displaying the passion, the love that God has for us. A love that's unconditional, no strings attached. A love that can enable us to follow him. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding fill your hearts with passion, with love for your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you may faithfully follow him today and every day. Amen. You may be seated.